Hey y'all, this is Coach Jose. Hey, just wanted to um, take a little time today and share a little bit about what's going on in the world and what God's doing in my heart. And um, felt like I have two fabulous young men here with me. One is my son, Lamar. Okay, he gets as good looks for me as you can tell. Okay, <laughs> and Pastor Ryan here is a pastor at our church here in North Phoenix. And we just, uh, you know, through the through the challenging time of COVID and um, the racial tension and stuff that's going on in the world, um, I just felt like the Lord leading me to just share a little bit about some of our experiences and how we can share what uh, each one of us has experienced over the years. Um, and I'm much older than them, have a little bit more life experience. Um, but at the same time, they have experiences that I could never um, feel or understand or be aware of without having good young men that love Jesus, that wanna make an impact in this world. And so we don't really have a whole agenda here. We had a small discussion about um, kind of what God has been doing in each one of our hearts and what we wanted to share. And so this is just kind of a time for us to share and um, hopefully encourage, challenge, and help each one of you watching this to be able to make an impact for the people that are around you. Uh, my heart as the owner at Real Athletics is really help people. Many of you guys know me close, understand that, and I think I have um, tried to do my best to lead, um, but I am not perfect. Jesus is perfect, and he's taught me a lot through this process, and so I just wanted to um, shed some light of what's going on and encourage those that uh, are part of what we do and around the world. So um, we're just going to have a little discussion and talk, and um, hopefully this helps you guys, and, and hopefully you guys can uh, take something away from this. So. I'll kind of be quiet at this point, and I think it's important that um, that uh, we just share our heart, guys, and just share, you know, what what's going on and a little perspective. So I don't know which one of you guys wants to start and share, but yeah. let's go for it. I mean, I'll start. I mean, I think uh, kind of the the big thing right now is the racial tension going on, uh, not just in America and in our world. And um, I think I know with me, just with my own personal experience growing up as a young black kid in the South, uh, my parent definitely had to have one of those talks with me about how to act when a policeman pulls you over. And to be honest, that was that was kind of like my first introduction into like, man, is there like a genuine fear that I should have when it comes to when it comes to cops? I remember thinking that as a young kid. Um, and then sure enough, uh, going on into like my early teenage and, and uh, even early 20s, I kind of experienced some of that. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people are um, really caring right now. Uh, I think like we talked about earlier, man, it's not so much just about a isolated incident with George Floyd or, or maybe some of the other names that have uh, been treated unjustly, man, but it's a lot of things that people have been carrying, not only throughout their lifetime, but man, for generations before us. And so um, I think it's really just been a perfect storm uh, in terms of like kind of the outrage that we see now, just a buildup um, of a lot of different things. And um, man, I totally understand it. And I think it's a time right now where people are looking for an answer. They're looking for even almost like a savior, if you will. And um, man, we can look to uh, protest and, and I think things like that will help. Um, I think we can look to maybe social or political reform and things like that will help. Like if the laws change to where um, people don't need to or, or people won't uh, hurt like black people or minorities. Uh, but man, like we always talk about, man, the answer at the end of the day is Christ. Um, because I think even if you do put certain laws in place, man, which are really necessary, dude, like that doesn't mean that the heart is transformed, you know? And right. so I think in this, in this time, like as, as, especially for me as a Christian man, man, I should be pushing for both. I, I should be protesting, man, and wanting real reform socially and politically to take place. But at the same time, I know that those, those things don't change the heart. It's only Christ that changes the heart and really transforms somebody. So that's kind of how I've been, been looking at everything. Yeah. yeah. Amen to that one. That's yeah. good. Yeah. And then similarly, like I grew up in the South as well as a black man. And my mom had to have a whole lot of those conversations as well. It's like, hey, don't have your pants down. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, you can't hang out with these cousins at night because this might happen. Or, you know, it was it was a thing like in the school. It's like, you know, nine times out of ten, if you were a black man, you ended up ended up in dead or in jail. Or in a gang, you know, selling drugs or something like that. I had a baby. And so it's like those were the, the past that were lined up for you and what you were to expect. And so to um, for me, it's, it's kind of, I have like a different perspective because even though I was around those things, I always felt like I was looking at it and that I never experienced it myself. Because for me, I never had, like I've, to this, to this day, I've never had like a bad 
experience with cops. Like all cops have been pretty nice to me. Um, anytime I've been pulled over, I've had cops try to recruit me to the force. I've had cops that were super nice. I've probably gotten one too many warnings. Um, <laughs> you know, like, so. So you got one for driving up the street too fast. I remember that one night. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, and, and he let you go. Yeah, and I had expired license. And yeah, he was right. like, I could give you a huge ticket right now. I was, But I was like, I'm right here at home, man. Like, help me out. <laughs> he was like, all right, man, you know, like, scoot on in there and, you know, don't drive no more. Um, and so it's like, and then I've had white godparents and white family members, white friends. And so it's like, for me, I've always been integrated. And so I'm like, I'm like, man, like, like what is, what is, what is this tension? Like, what are people feeling because at least for me and like how I view the world I don't I don't really see it I don't really feel it and so for me even during this time it was a good it was a good thing for me to be able to talk to guys like Ryan and and other people who have experienced the the bad side that can come because racism is real and it is a sin like we've talked about before like that is a that is a heart issue and granted, it doesn't apply to everybody, but we are all sinners. And so, like Ryan was saying, we should have political reform and, and police reform and things like that to where people can't, you know, murder a man in cold blood. But at the same time, it's like, we also need to have like more deep conversations like these with across the country so people can understand like where the heart went wrong, you know, and how Jesus can, Jesus is the only one that can change your heart. Cause I know for me, like before I met Christ, I was at Arizona State and it's like I was in a fraternity and I was pounding alcohol and getting drunk. And it's like, I felt no conviction. And I was like, oh yeah, this, I'm fine. Like I'm chilling, I'm having fun. This is college, this is what it's meant for. And then I go to Arizona Christian and I get saved. And it's like, now I look back, I'm like, man, it's, it's literally two different human beings, but it's, I'm the same person. It's because my heart was changed and my mind was changed. And so it's like, you know, some people don't even realize, you know, they don't even know because that's just what they're raised to do. You know, like for me, it was it was cool to drink. It was cool to smoke. It was cool to, you know, have sex. Like those were the cool things to do with the group that I was around. And until I found Christ and he changed my heart, then I was able to see it through like how God views it and what the Bible says about it, you know, to be of sound mind. You know, to not be intoxicated, to love each other as you would love yourself. Those weren't things that I learned growing up from the group I was around. I learned that when I got saved and I started to study the Bible and build a relationship with Christ. And then those became my values. And now I'm now that's where I come from. So we're like, hey, man, you know, I, I talked to Ryan. It's like, hey, I may not fully understand, you know, why a cop will pull you over and put you in handcuffs and assume you have weed because that's never happened to me. But I know as my brother in Christ, I love you. And the fact that you went through that, like hurts me too. And that's that's something that shouldn't be okay. Yeah, I think that, I'm not trying to be the interview guy here, but like that's something I think you should share about like, Lamar's been fortunate not to have those experiences and that's by God's grace. But for you as, you know, a pastor who loves Jesus and was a phenomenal college athlete, you know, at the highest level, to experience that I think it's important for a lot of people to not they don't they don't they've never worried about jogging down the street you know what I mean they've never yeah. stressed about driving late at night you know and so I think I think if you wouldn't mind share about like an experience that happened to you and how that made you feel and how it was real it's not made up um, and I think I think that's important to share but then also how God has transformed you and helped you understand like it, it's, a, it's a sin issue. So right. I, I don't know if you just might yeah, share about a, that. Absolutely, man. Um, so just a few times uh, that I've gotten pulled over, just some, some run-ins that I've had uh, that weren't weren't super pleasant. Um, for example, one time um, I got a speeding ticket, and obviously I, I was speeding. Uh, but, man, as, as soon as the cop got to my door, man, the first words he said was, get out the car. And I'm like, whoa, man, I'm just speeding. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going 84, like, my, my bad. But, but the first words he said was, get out the car. And... And as soon as I got out the car, he was like, put your hands on the car. And he immediately put me in handcuffs. And like, that was, he did that first and then wanted to ask questions. And um, so that was just an experience for me then. And that was, that was probably one of the first times that I had like a really like shocking run. I'm like, man, why did, why did he do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why did he just immediately detain me and put me in handcuffs? I feel like 
when you're speeding, it's just supposed to be, you just talk it out, they give you a ticket, you move on. But, so that was the first time. And we ended up talking it out. And I was kind of explaining to him, like, look, I'm a level-headed dude. Like, I'm not here to cause any trouble. I'm not here to resist you. And he ended up letting me go. Uh, man, the second time, um, I had got pulled over. And um, uh, for this time, I had got pulled over. It was a similar instance. He told me to get out the car. Uh, but this time, he kind of had a motive. And he was looking into my eyes. And he was like, you've been smoking weed tonight. And I was like, dude, I'm leaving a high school football game. I was just coaching my, my young guys, man. Like, I just want to get home in the middle of nowhere, Arizona. So that's probably where I went wrong. <laughs> that's probably where I went wrong. But um, he was like, man, you've been smoking weed tonight. And um, man, a similar situation, put me in handcuffs, put me in the back of his car. And he told me that he was going to take me to jail um, if he didn't search my car. He's like, if you don't let me search, I'm going to take it. I'm like, man, do your thing. I ain't got nothing in there. <laughs> so he searches my car. Um, didn't find anything, of course. And then he takes me out of the car and um, he does like a test on me to see whether I'm high or not. So he's having me like look into the distance and do all this stuff. And then at the end of it, he's like, you're lying to me. You, you've been smoking. Like, I'm like, dude, I don't know. I've never smoked a day in my life. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what else I got to tell you. And he ended up uh, hassling me some more. Uh, and then again, the more I talk it out with them and they kind of, it's almost like they see that like I'm level headed and like I'm not trying to cause trouble. I'm just trying to be on my way. They end up letting me go. And then another time, man, that, that just stands out to me um, was I got pulled over for um, for not using my blinker, which is, which is justified. I mean, you pull people over for that. Um, but I remember when the cop was approaching my vehicle, man, he was like in like a, a crouched position, like with his knees bent. And then he had his hand on his gun, just walking up really slowly. And I remember putting my hands on the steering wheel, like, first of all, I didn't even know that I did. So I didn't even know that I didn't use my blinker. Mm -hmm. But I remember putting my hands on the steering wheel, like, yo, if I sneeze right now, mm -hmm. this dude could whip out his gun and fire off on me. And so um, those have just been a few of my experiences, man, to where I clearly know when talking to some of my white brothers and sisters, when it comes to stuff like speeding or getting pulled over for a blinker or whatever, or just a regular traffic stop, they don't have those type of, those type of experiences. Uh, but I think you hit the nail on the head, man. It's it's so important that we don't paint this as a, like, man, all cops are like this are racist or all white people are racist because it's not white versus black or the black versus the police. It should be everybody versus racism. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It should be everybody versus racism because like you said, it's not so much a, a skin issue as it is a sin issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, uh, man, like I said, man, there can be laws put in place to, to keep people from maybe you know, abusing their power as policemen, but man, at the end of the day, man, those guys need to hear the gospel. You know, those guys need to hear that, look, man, look, it's, it's not just about that you're, you're, you're falling short and sinning in this area of your life, brother. Your whole life is probably in darkness, dude. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But there's a savior, there's a Christ, man, that can transform you, that can redeem you, that can wash you clean of any and everything you've done. Um, and so, yeah, man, growing up in the South, that was pretty, pretty regular practice. And even outside of police, like the first fight I ever grew up in um, was a white dude calling me the N-word in elementary school. And that's just kind of the tensions that are just mm -hmm. pretty regular, uh, at least regular for me, at least in the South. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that's just some of my experiences and what I've, what I've been through. And, I, and I, I can never say I experienced those things and I can't understand those things. And um, I, can, I can try to, I think I, I shared with both Ryan and Lamar earlier before we got on this about, like, I think it's important for all of us to understand, you know, what lens each person is looking through. I mean, you're talking about generations possibility of, of being mistreated, right? And then if you look at it from that perspective of like Ryan's experience multiple times over, he should have a natural tension and frustration to be able to feel that, right? And then you look at Lamar's situation where he's been grace-filled, you know? And it's not about cops versus blacks or white versus black. It's about Jesus and who he is and how he views each one of us. And so I think it's important for all of us to understand this as we're sharing this with you, that what lens are you choosing to look through? Do you choose to look through only my vision, only my experience? Are you open to say, wow, I've never viewed it that way, you know? And I'll, I'll switch it up on us on sports real quick. Being a, being a coach and being a former professional athlete and a scout stuff, and coaching many many kids I used to like not sleep at night when parents would get mad at me because their kid wouldn't hit the lineup in the right way or wouldn't play the position to do because I really wanted to help the kid be successful and I didn't think where they hit in the lineup or what they did and different things and parents would freak out on me long emails and text messages and I'm like the kid's 12 does it really matter but it stressed me out right yeah 
And then, and then Pastor, Pastor Hutch said, hey, have you ever thought about like the, the parents from their lens, they're just trying to do what's best for their kid. Mm-hmm. And they just don't know how to relay that information. And if you think about that, like it switched my thinking to that parent just doesn't know how to go about this properly. But all they're trying to do is what's best for their kid in baseball, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And I think if we view the racial tension and not make it a black and white thing, a cop and a good thing, and you guys tell me if you feel differently, and we view it from the lens of Christ, and we view it from, if Ryan had this experience, God would really feel that grace and compassion and mercy and understanding, right? Mm-hmm. And if Lamar has this experience, the thankfulness and the, and the appreciativeness, if that's a word. <laughs> you speak better English than I do. Yeah. I speak in a Spanish. <laughs> uh, and, and, and see it from that lens, I think that helps us as a whole, as a society, understand that it's not just our own experience. Right. And I think that's important for me, you know, being raised the way I was and being a minority community and having all sorts of fellowship and being so thankful for our church and Pastor Hutch in Seattle and North Phoenix here being diverse. Um, it's so easy to us to raise our families in that. But I think at the end of the day, do we choose to have grace and mercy for cops, white, black, brown, no matter what it is? Do we choose to do that? Because it is a choice. Because you can choose to be bitter. You can choose to be frustrated. You can choose to be mean. You can choose to do all these things. But each and every day we have a choice to wake up to say, do I choose to do what's right? Do I choose to make a difference? Do I choose to be a life giver? Am I giving life to a situation? Or am I bringing more tension to it? Am I complaining just to complain? There's a Bible that says do all things. The Bible verse says do all things without complaining. Already. Was it Philippians 2.14? 2.14. God doesn't say do some of the things. He says do all things without complaining and arguing. So anything that happened in your life, anything that happened in your life, in my life. When my dad died on my eighth birthday, that was the worst day of my life. But like God has used that experience to many, 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 many kids in my program. Their dads have died, and I knew exactly what to say to that kid. Mm. I knew exactly how to show compassion and mercy and be there for them Mm. because not too many people have experienced that, right? right? And so I think when he says, do all things without complaining or arguing, doesn't mean you're not going to be hurt. Doesn't mean you're not going to understand. Doesn't mean that you're not going to be upset or confused or hurt or bitter or frustrated. But what lens do we choose to wake up to every day and say, I'm gonna choose to show grace and mercy and kindness and forgiveness, the fruit of the spirit, right? Mm-hmm. And so that, that would be my encouragement to all of us, to myself included each and every day, that this stuff is real. When you walk into, you guys can share about this too, when you walk into a restaurant as a minority family, you get looked at differently, period and a statement. And if you're an all-white family and you've never experienced that, there's a reason for that. Because that's just like the norm. You know what I mean? And and so I just wanted to, I don't know what the Lord was trying to tell me to tell you guys there, but just that it's all about grace, love, kindness, mercy, and forgiveness. But making a choice to give life to others versus the narrative of he's wrong, I'm right, you're an idiot, I'm not. You know, and, and and that's that the world is not going to be a better place if we have that mindset. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys want to expand and touch on that. Yeah, I think I would, I would definitely agree with that, because um, I know, like for me, like, given all of my experiences that I've had in my life, even when I was talking to Ryan, I'm like, I can't pick a side of the coin, and it's. It's almost like I feel like there shouldn't even be a coin to have a side of because it's like I've I've been raised by a white family. I've been raised by a black family. You know, I've been raised with no family. I had to raise myself, you know. So it's like I've had pretty much everything that you could go through and all the while being black and being in America, you know, being in the South and then being in Arizona and then going to Washington, you know, and Mexico where don't nobody care what you look like in Mexico. <laughs> you know, like, they just want to know if you want Coke or weed, you know? <laughs> so it's like, um, you know, like all of these experiences bungled up create Lamar. And then so, like you're saying, it's a choice what lens I choose to look at it through. And quite honestly, I don't think I've been as open-minded. You know, for a large part of my life, I was like, you know, like, black people need to step up or, 
like black this is this is imaginary like i made it out like you can too like this is not happening to you and and then like now it's like wow like who am i to tell somebody what they've been through you know who am i to to be the the judge to be like oh you shouldn't feel this way or you should feel this way that's not my place you know and and that's something that christ has revealed to me through this like so that's if i could say that i've learned anything through the protests through the riots through the outcries of my fellow black americans is that is that like for too long i was i was like almost like ashamed of the black community of like oh like they're 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 just like out there just letting people run over them or letting people just like use them or they got these chain mental chains that aren't there and it's like it's like we're like no Lamar like that's that's not it at all mm-hmm. you know it's like they're they're genuinely you know being discriminated against and just because God blessed me to where I didn't have to deal with it as much you know because I'm I'm pretty sure you can find any black person on the street and they've dealt with racism what one at some point in their life they've been called the n-word you know with the hard r <laughs> with the hard r you know and i can remember the first time like i literally remember vividly the first time i was ever called the n-word with the hard r because i was like i was like where is this rage coming from you know like it was i had never been called that before and then it hit me and i'm like i was like infuriated and i was like i don't know where this is coming from like that, it was just like in my being that like we don't get we don't get that that word doesn't you don't you don't do that mm-hmm. you know and so um so that's that's one thing that I know I've learned for sure during this time and given COVID you know being at the house all the time and being able to reflect on like what am I doing as a black man that was that God had grace on you know to to help my fellow black Americans to say hey not not every not every white cop is bad and instead of going against them, just letting them know like, hey, there's there's light at the end of the tunnel. They're like, Jesus loves you. And if you give your life to Christ, like there's no condemnation for those who love Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so that way, regardless of whether, you know, a black man, a white man, a yellow man, whoever discriminates against you or treats you some type of way, like Christ died for your sins. Like specifically, he had you in mind when you were in your mother's womb. You know, and he didn't care what color you were. He told us to go and make disciples of all nations. And he knew they would all look different, you know. And so that's something that I've been reflecting on and I've been meditating on, you know, as mentor, as Ryan's been mentoring me, you know, just sitting on the fact that like, wow, like Jesus is so much bigger than the color of one's skin that why, why would I make it a big deal and, and be, you know, almost like a hypocrite myself, you know? So that's mm-hmm. that's something that I've been able to reflect and be honest with myself with. You mentioned the COVID thing and you talked about earlier in there about what it, what has COVID made us reflect on? You mm-hmm. talked about that, so share about that a little bit. Yeah, maybe. man, I think, um, I think it's so easy for us just to get so caught up just in the hustle and bustle of life. And we're just so focused, man, on our business, on our family, just on what we have to do here and now, which are our good things in and of themselves. But I think in that, man, we can forget about death. <laughs> we can forget about like, man, there's there's something that happens after after we leave this earth. And um, I think we're reminded of that in times like COVID where, where people around us are, are dying left and right. I mean, every single day, man. I mean, you look at even in Arizona alone in the last um, two, three weeks, man, there's been multiple deaths. And so um, I think this is just a time where people get a chance to reflect. Like, look, dude, like there is such thing as death. Like this this life will come to an end one day. And I think if you look at the majority of people, they're living in fear um, of that time to come, uh, either fear of the unknown or fear because they know man, that they haven't been been living right. And they sense that there's something there's something after this. But the beautiful thing about a life with Jesus, man, is that it's a life of security because, you know, that, look, man, I, I don't need to cling on to this earthly life. And I don't need to have this mindset to where, man, if I don't do what I want to do and accomplish my dreams here on earth, man, like my my existence is wasted. Like, no, man, we, we have an eternal hope. Uh, we know, man, that we have an in- inheritance waiting on us after we leave this place, man. And it's so much better than anything Jesus. you could ever gain here mm-hmm. on this earth. You know, I've, I've, I've heard it said that um, for a believer, man, uh, death, 
you gain something better than anything that you could ever gain here on this earth because you gain Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And so, um, and so, yeah, man, I think it's important that if there are people out there that do have a fear of death because of all the COVID that's going on, that you don't have to live like that. Like, man, you can put your faith in Christ and know that your eternity is secure. And you'll know that at the end of the day, like, you know, no one actually dies. You just change locations. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll know that, man, if I put my hope in Christ, man, I'm going to change my location to a beautiful place and to an inheritance that's waiting on me. Amen so. to that. And, that, and that, that. that's so good because it's like, no matter what side of the fence you're on, if you believe it's a hoax, if you believe it's real, if it only affects black people, it only affects white people, it only affects young, old, whatever. Yep. Like, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, the, the, at the end of the day, each one of us are guaranteed life and death. And God knows when that time's going to take place, right? And so, um, no matter what you believe within it, you know, is it the left doing it? Is it the right doing it? Is it to get Trump out of the house? I mean, we can all sit here and have those discussions yeah. over and over and over again. But at the end of the day, like, each one of us have our days numbered. You know? And... To change locations into paradise, like I get a smile thinking about it. You know what I mean? Just because saved by grace alone. You know what I mean? And so, um, I don't know. You, you fellas have anything else you want to discuss or talk about? Yeah, I would just, I would just encourage everybody. I mean, if you don't know Christ, you know, talk to somebody. Reach out to my dad here. He's very knowledgeable. Um, reach out to anyone you know who loves Christ or even if you don't know just go get a Bible and we'll send you one Jesus yeah message. yeah let us know we'll send you a Bible read the John book in the world <laughs> you know John wrote his book so that you know people would believe mm -hmm. um and so it's like if you, if you don't know Christ like then you are subject to the ebbs and flows of the world and one thing that I know with certainty is that when I pass away that I'm going to be with Christ and all of us here have that certainty. And that's why we can have this conversation and we can go to bed at night knowing that if we don't wake up here, we're gonna wake up with Christ. You know, that when when our time comes, because I've had to remind people sometimes, they're like, you know, you have your wife, your kids, your friends, and yeah, you're supposed to take care of them and love them, you know, the way you love yourself. But at the same time, when, when that time's up, like it's you and Christ, and he is judging you and if your name's not in the book of life it like if your works don't matter you know how much time you spent with your wife doesn't matter none of that matters how much money you spent to charity none of that adds up to get you eternal life only thing that will ever get you that is having a relation relationship with with christ jesus and it just comes through getting to know him and and reading the word and just knowing who he is. And if you don't, I encourage you too. <laughs> Cause I just can I can remember when I first met Christ, like genuinely, I was still homeless. I was still broke. My account was negative actually. Like I was beyond broke. And I was still, you know, I was still working at Sam's Club. So anybody that walked past electronics in Sam's Club, them people that try to stop you, Hey, who used free TV and internet? That was me. Imagine doing that for six months of your life every day. It's hard. For There's people. worse things in the world. <laughs> people tell you no in the most creative ways. And if you're one of those people, you need to repent. <laughs> um, but it's just like, even through the midst of all of that and not knowing where my life was going to go, but feeling like I failed all my dreams and I was a failure, I was, I had joy. Like, I laid in my car and I was like, wow. Like, I'm at peace. I don't know why, but I, I'm at peace because I, my life's not in my hands anymore. You know, so that would be my peace. That's good, man. And um, I think for me, um, not to be obviously too pessimistic, man, but I, I don't know if our society will ever get to a place of just euphoria and peace and everybody is just getting along happily ever after. Um, I don't think that'll happen until Christ comes back. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think in the meantime, man, we can make progress. And, and we can have the tough conversations with the people in our lives who maybe um, we haven't maybe chosen to show them grace and mercy and kindness, like you said. Because you can choose to do one or two things. You can choose to show them grace and mercy and love and extend yourself to them. Or you can choose to turn a blind eye to what they're going through. Mm -hmm. You know, And so I think if there's anybody listening to this and you find yourself in that second category, 
but you know what, I think I have kind of been turning a blind eye and I really um, haven't been slow to speak and quick to listen. And man, you do that. And you sit down with maybe some of the minority brothers and sisters in your life and you ask them like, man, what have you gone through? And I uh, mean, how can I best love you during this time? And so, you would appreciate that, wouldn't oh, you? Man, it mean the world to me. And it's right. happened to me. And, it, right. and it's, it's been awesome. Yeah, and, and I think it's important for everybody to watch in this is to know that we don't think the world after this video is going to change and everything's going to be perfect, right. like you're saying. Like, there's, there's sin in the world. Yeah. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. Absolutely. And so it's never going to be perfect until Jesus reigns. Right. Right? And he is, he is, he, he has done that for every single one of us. But we do have a choice. We do have a choice to wake up and give life every day. We have a choice to give life or to suck it dry, right? And so if you have questions, reach out. Don't be afraid. I will tell you, I have a lot of minority friends and they welcome the opportunity to have discussions. Don't be, don't be, don't be worried about it because it's real, it's out there. And I think the more discussions we have, the more we work together, and the more the more we look at like how do we make things better it might just be your family to affect mm -hmm. the next generation that affects multiple generations you know what i mean and it starts with one you know Absolutely. and so um, i think we're realists we, we understand there's going to be more tension there's going to be more killings there's going to be more murders there's going to be more racism there's going to be more but at the end of the day do we have a choice to make a difference in our own circle that's good right, right? and and I think rather than going too far right, too far left, up, down, whatever, focus on who can make the change. Mm -hmm. And the change is Jesus, you know? And if, if we can fix our eyes on Jesus alone, he will direct our path, what to say, when to say it, how to say it, you know? Absolutely. So I think it's important we keep it real. I think it's important that we love and understand that Jesus loves you and he cares about you and he wants to do something spectacular in your life. Because if he can change this wretched soul and heart and mind, he can change anybody, you know. And I want to encourage each and every one of you to live life to the fullest. Jesus loves you. He cares about you. And just know that no matter what you're going through, he is there every step of the way. Before, after, during, in you, around you, surround you each and every day. God bless everybody. Peace. Hey, yo. Peace.